Okay. So uh, thank you all for coming. This is Make Your Research Visible. Um, my name is Miranda Fair. I am the Publishing and Open Scholarship Librarian here at Cook Library. I'll let Carrie introduce herself. I'm Carrie Price. I'm the Research Impact and Health Professions Librarian here at Cook Library. Whoops. Uh, so today we're going to cover a few different key points um, all about sort of increasing the visibility and discoverability of your research, more places you can put it, etc. cetera. Um, so we're gonna talk about scholar profiles and persistent identifiers. We'll go over a few of those, talk a bit about impact, um, and then sharing your work more broadly, and then talk a bit about the scholarly publishing landscape. And we will wrap up by um, pointing out some library resources that can help you with this. And so we do encourage you to use the chat and there aren't that many people here. So feel free to unmute yourselves. We'd like this to be interactive. If you have a question, please ask it. And so I'll start talking about scholar profiles. There are a couple different tools you can use for scholarly profiles. They can help you keep track of your own work because as you go along in time, it might be difficult to even do that. So you can pull all your work into one place. You can pull different types of work into one place. So conference proceedings, reports, um, protocols, as well as journal articles, books, and book chapters. They can help you update your CV. And some of them will even give you metrics so that you can understand your research impact in your field a little bit better. So we'll go over three of these today. The first one is ORCID from orchid.org. And um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat if I can manage to do that here. I have a browser open. So if you don't have an ORCID, it stands for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. It's, it's uh, not affiliated with any one institution or organization, rather it's a, it's a collaboration between many research organizations and you can read more about them here. They've been around for uh, a while now and they're doing really good work. It's considered basically a social security number for your research. So if you don't have an account the first time you can sign in or register and then you'll be able to access through your institution once you link it up to Towson. So I'll just uh, walk you through what it looks like here. And we'll share our slides today. You've all signed up via email. So we'll share our slides out. There are links and screenshots for that. And I have screenshots just in case the uh, site is down, but it looks like it's going to work. So this is your identifier. Once you sign up, you get the 16 digit number and you can preview your public record. So what the public sees when they come to your ORCID profile. <clears throat> You can put in your employment, you can put in a bio, all of this is optional. You can put in some, none, all. You can add your education, professional activities. Um, and as you go down, you get to add works. So you can, sorry, you have to be on the back end to add anything. You can add, and you can add through PubMed, through Scopus, you can add manually, you can add records from Google Scholar, like an exported BibTeX from Google Scholar, you can add a DOI, and then it's all collected here. And then you can put this link in your profile, uh, in your email signature, on your CV, on your grant applications, and that way someone can see all of your work. So I'm putting, oh, I already did. I put orchid.org in the chat. Do uh, raise your hand if you know how on Zoom to um, let me know if you have an ORCID already. Do you already have an ORCID, anyone here? Good, super, okay. So highly recommend. Um, the next tool is from the Lens. Now this is a new tool in the field. It's lens.org. And we'll go to the browser here. This is a free tool out of some research organizations in Australia. You can use it to search for patents, scholarly works. You can use it to search for profiles. So when we're talking about profiles, keep in mind, we're not just talking about your own. You can see other people's research impact here. You could look up 
uh, pretty much anyone who's published. So you can go to profiles and you can search by a name. Um, I'll just use somebody we all are probably familiar with. Doesn't matter if you do first, last, last, first, it's pretty smart. And so we'll see some people um, with similar names and we'll click on Dr. Anthony Fauci. Sometimes it takes a while to load, but what you'll see here are some summary stats about this person's work, your own work, someone else's work. They have, um, uh, I wonder if this is the guy, this might have changed. Um, if the person has an orchid, it pulls in from their orchid. Um, but I don't think Dr. Fauci has set up his orchid yet, actually. So let me just show you. Um, myself. This is a really fun tool because it looks so nice. It does a lot of the legwork for you and going out and finding your citations. And you can share it. You can add a profile picture. You can talk about, um, you can see your summary stats. And it's pulling from your open researcher and contributor ID if you have that set up. And if you don't have that set up, well, it's just going to show you what it finds through lens.org, which is a scholarly search engine, kind of like Google Scholar, only a little bit better. <clears throat> so my open access ratio is 49%. I've collaborated on 85% of those. H-index is an author metric, which tells you how many works you have cited at least how many times. So if you have 21, um, then you have at least 21 works that have been cited at least 21 times with 4,700 citations and I have no patents. It'll show you your, your fields of study, your graph over time. And this is the information it's getting from ORCID. It shows you right here, ORCID. As you go down, it'll show you your works and you can click on those and see who cited you, um, who you cited and other similar works. You can even usually see if it's open access and then link out to that open access link. I really like Lens. I think they're doing a good job and they're doing it for free. So that's kind of excellent. I'll just keep this on non-presenter mode for now. Any questions about the Lens? Now, the other research profile tool is called Scobus, and that's a subscription database available through the Cook Library. So we can go to the Cook Library. All of our databases, over 400 plus, are listed on the A to Z databases list over here on the left. You can scroll through, look at S, or you can just search for Scobus. Now, they're from the big publisher called Elsevier. And normally we would use it, the default is to look for articles, books, book chapters, but there are tabs up here at the top and you can look for authors. And again, you can look for yourself, you can look for other people. Maybe we'll have better luck with Dr. Anthony Fauci this time. We'll click search and we're going to get a list of all the Anthony Fauci's. There's more than one, but it'll be pretty easy to see which one we want, this first one. And it's not always intuitive here what we want to do. We want to click on the author's name. Uh, but we do see that they have 1,195 documents in H index of 189. If you click on this I, it'll just walk you through that author index, um, author metric of the H index. And if you're having trouble finding people, you can always uh, narrow by affiliation. So we'll click on this researcher and we get to a profile dashboard, which is really useful. Now, this isn't something you can share very easily since it is a subscription database, but it's something that you can use to look people up, to look yourself up, and to understand your research impact over time. So Scopus went online in the late 90s, so it doesn't go back much before that, although I imagine this author in particular was probably publishing before 1995. 
And then down here we see the documents, some author metrics, the citations, preprints, which are not formally peer reviewed, and their co-authors, topics, and awarded grants. All of this is interactive, so you can click on any one record, you can click on the citations, and in Scopus you can even see the number of times that a person was a first author or a last author. So in science especially, uh, first authors usually did a lot of the writing and the work, the last author is usually the mentor, and then the people in the middle uh, are the people who contributed in some other way. So Scopus is an excellent tool. Those are the three research profile tools that I like to recommend, uh, ORCID, Scopus, and the Lens. Now, do you have to have them all? Absolutely not. Um, if you're going to have just one, I would recommend ORCID because it actually syncs with a lot of these other tools just um, by the way that it's set up. One thing I'd like to mention is that if you are applying for any NIH or NSF grants. Um, there's a research profile tool from NIH and the National Library of Medicine called SciNCV, and you'll need to set that up in order to apply for these types of grants. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You just log in, you can sync it up with your ORCID, and you can add your works depending on the grant. And we had a comment in the chats about um, more publishers and grants are asking for ORCID, which is true. So um, it's yeah. helpful to have that. Isn't there a mandate now, Miranda? I think if you're applying for NIH, also you you are required to have an ORCID now. And some publishers, you're right, are requiring an ORCID. And I think this is a great time for us to mention that uh, in the upcoming weeks during open access week, we're going to be having an ORCID, ORCID raffle. And what that means is we're off, we're auctioning off an ORCID plant to someone who uses an ORCID. So stay tuned for more information for that. Yeah, we'll be tabling in the science complex on I think Wednesday and Thursday of that week, but I mean, we'd love it if you come say hi, but you don't have to. There will also be a web form going out and you don't have to if you already have an ORCID, you can still enter. You can just say, hey, here's mine. And I updated my employment information or I added this grant that I got. Um, and you are still eligible to win an ORCID. Yeah, a very, a very beautiful flower, flowering plant. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about today before Miranda takes over is your research impact. We have a guide at Towson. And so I'll, I'll walk you through this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there are ways to look at your author level metrics. We talked about the H index, Google Scholar. Um, oh, I didn't talk about Google Scholar. Google Scholar also has an I-10 index. There are article level metrics. So you can look at the number of sites per article, mentions, shares, and usage statistics. And then there are journal level metrics. So we've all heard of the impact factor and some other journal level metrics. So let's take a look. Uh, let me go out to the web here. <clears throat> and it's, um, well, let me show you how to get there. I think that would probably be the most helpful thing. We'll go to the Cook Library homepage, which is your landing point for a lot of different things. And then under research guides, we have different types of guides. And under topic guide, alphabetically, you can scroll down to research metrics. So this is sort of a landing point for all the tools we have at Towson, all the tools that we as librarians in this field suggest for using. So lots of links here, even links for responsible use and ethics. There's been a lot of movement about using these tools ethically over the past decade. Author metrics uh, are things like your H index and your I-10 index, which is uh, a measurement of how many of your publications have at least 10 citations. And uh, looking at Google Scholar profiles, which is a tool I didn't mention, which is another really common tool, which seems to be down today. Okay, here it is. So you can also look up people in Google Scholar um, and you can add an 
you can add your own profile picture. It's going to give you some metrics over here. Again, show you who cited you. Now we should mention Google Scholar tends to be a bit more complimentary because it's just finding more things. Uh, and so you'll see higher numbers in Google Scholar than you will in say Scopus or the Lens. Let's go back to the research impact guide, research metrics. Article level metrics are sometimes hard to gather. We call these also alternative metrics or alt metrics. So citation tracking is a thing you can do. You can see who cited you um, using different kinds of tools here. There's a tool called the Altmetric Bookmarklet. And I'm going to put a link here in the chat. Once you install the Altmetric Bookmarklet, which is a free browser plugin, then when you land on any article on the internet, uh, let's show you, there's some ways to see. Oh, they haven't linked to this. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so what happens is you'll be on a article level page in a journal or on PubMed or in a, a preprint archive, any article level page should work. And when you enable the altmetric bookmarklet, you'll be able to um, click on it in your browser and see who's blogged it, who's tweeted it, who shared it on Facebook pages or mentioned it in Google posts. And when you click for more details, it shows you even where in the world these blogs occurred. It gives you links to the blogs, links to the tweets, links to the Facebook pages. So this is really cool. Um, you will have seen this a lot for COVID controversial topics. Um, so it's an interesting way to see who shared your yours or others' research. And then there are journal level metrics. So we talk a lot about the impact factor, um, but Scopus, which is the database we have at Towson, does site score, Samago journal rank, and source normalized impact per paper. These are meant to um, weigh in on a, a journal's impact, but within a field. So these are weighted say, weighted metrics that say, well, this is a smaller field of research, so the impact isn't as great, but it still has a big impact in this field. And so you can read through those. And then we have links to lots of tools and resources that we'll talk about um, later on at the end of today. Um, so I think that's it for research impact. Uh, do we do you have any questions about your research impact or how to find research impact before I turned it back over to Miranda? Miranda, would you like me to stop screen sharing so you can take over or? Yeah, I can screen share. Okay, I'll stop sharing. You're welcome. Hmm, let's see if I pick the right one. Okay, can you see the? Yes. Like presenter, the non-presenter version. Okay, cool. Um. Okay, so it decides to load. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about publishing. I'm sure you've noticed some changes in um, what's happening with uh, publishing recently. So we'll talk a bit about those and some ways that you're able to share your work to make sure more people are able to see it. So um, just a bit about the landscape in general. Um, academic publishing market is a, a very big industry. It's a $20.4 billion industry. Um, and the profit margins are really high because, I mean, I'm sure you know this, you are researching and writing articles and getting them published as part of your job. Um, but the publishers who publish it then sell them back to the institutions, um, usually through the library, um, so that you're able to access them. Um, that is, so there's a graph here that kind of shows how... Um, especially with like online journals, the expenditures have gone up. Now this stops at 2011, but it's continued to go up from there. Um, and we just have some screenshots here. 
talking about paywalls because that is a barrier to people reading your articles or looking at your research. Um, this this one's on a um, news website, so you've probably seen this before and you've reached your three article limit. Um, but it's similar to what you see on a, um, a database when you've hit a paywall. I put the slides out of order. This is the one I wanted to show you um, in Science Direct. Like you might not have access to it via your institutional login. It's going to ask you to purchase the PDF. Don't ever do that. There's other ways to get it. Um, but that is something that the library is able to help with. Um, but the way you might be thinking about it is like, not how can I read this article, but how can people who want to read my article be able to read it if they don't have access to it through an institution? Maybe they can't pay to read it, or should they? Um, another thing that's caused a lot of changes, as you probably are aware of, the Nelson Memo, which came out last year. Um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House released a memo requiring that um, all federally funded research um, be made free immediately, so no embargo, um, to the public um, without having to wait and without having to pay for it. Um, this is, it does have an impact on how you can publish um, things. I think it's by the end of 2025, but some organizations have tried to push up their deadline to be sooner. Um, this applies to both publications and to data. And while a lot of these um, federal funders are going to be in the sciences or in STEM fields, not all of them are. So um, humanities grants, any of these other ones, you might have a grant through. Um, are going to require that you make this information available to everybody. Um, so generally the easiest way to do this is um, through publishing open access. And there are a few different ways to do this. Um, I will we'll talk a bit about it. Um, so one of the reasons you might wanna do is because you have to do it because your funder has informed you that you need to. Another reason you might wanna do it is just so more people can see it. Um, and so, that is, that is kind of the goal of this today, talking about making your work visible. Um, there have been a lot of papers written about um, whether or not the open access citation advantage exists, um, but there's a pretty recent, it was two, two years ago, um, systematic review that looked at all of the available articles at the time about looking at whether the open access citation advantage was real. Um, they found that almost half of it confirmed that it was, um, over a quarter found it didn't exist, um, some found it in subsets, so maybe in some fields more than others, you're going to have more than a um, more of a citation advantage. Um, and that one study was inconclusive, but generally, it does mean that your work is going to be cited more because it's easier to find um, researchers that are at other institutions, maybe in other parts of the world that aren't as well funded as they are, kind of in the global north, um, are able to read it and cite it. Um, which is good because it should be for everybody to be able to read. Um, and there are different types of open access and they they have these like color names. So it's like gold and green and bronze, things like that. I'll briefly go over what each of them means. Um, gold OA is like what you're going to run into most of the time, which is um, the like you pay a publisher an article processing charge, which we'll talk about a bit on the next slide. Um, so usually the commercial publishers are going to have this. Some of them are the publishers that are also subscription publishers. So like Springer Nature, Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, those are kind of the big names we run into a lot. Um, green open access is um, sharing your work. Oh, we have a hand raise. Yes. I was wondering, I get regular emails from AERA Open. Is that, are they in one of these colors? I've not heard of that, actually. Um, yeah, they regularly market for some reason. I'm on their mailing list, and I always wondered about that. It's like AERA interesting. Open. Okay. Yeah. I'm, when I get to the demos, I'm going to look at that because I'm AERA Open. American and Oh, yeah. We'll look in front. Huh. Yes, I will. I'm interested. To, I also end up on a lot of mailing lists, so I understand that. Um, my guess is they're either going to be gold or, or diamond, but we will see. Um, 
green OA is like sharing in an institutional repository. So you're putting usually the not publisher formatted version of something on a repository. It could be the one we have here. Um, it could be a different one. And we'll talk about that a bit later too. The other ones I'm not going to talk about as much because I think they're less common. Hybrid is um, when a journal basically has some articles that are open access and they do charge um, a article processing charge for it. And then some articles that are closed access or like subscription charge. So they're getting money both from subscriptions um, and from article processing charges. I'm going to give that a thumbs down, but, but they do exist. And there are a few out there. Um, bronze open access. I don't, it just means it's something that's like freely available on the internet. Um, which a lot of open access stuff is. The difference is that all of these other types are going to offer some kind of persistent archiving. Um, and usually they have specified license restrictions, well, conditions, um, usually using Creative Commons, but they might be using other kinds of open licenses. Bronze isn't necessarily using an open license. So the reuse stipulations aren't really clear. And because it's just on the internet and not archived in any way, um, it might just disappear one day and that's it. And there's no way to get it back, um, which is why it has that distinction. Then diamond open access, which um, isn't really the the predominant way of doing it in um, like in North America or in Europe. Um, I'd say gold open access probably is, but um, Latin America is really the leader on diamond open access. And this is going to be like scholar led journals that are open access for everybody to get and they are not um they don't charge article processing charges so you don't have to pay a fee to publish in any of these um you also don't have to pay a fee to read it anybody can usually um they're smaller because they're coming from an institution or some other kind of nonprofit um they might be housed at a library we have one that's <laughs> starting but it's still kind of in its very early stages um but that's that's sort of a different way of approaching this. Um, so I'll talk a bit about gold open access publishing. I'm not going to get too deep into this because we have another workshop coming up in um, two weeks during open access week. I believe it's exactly two weeks from today where I will um, talk at length about um, uh, article processing charges, different kinds of costs associated with it, things like that. Um, but what Gold Open Access Publishing, I did want to mention it because we are going to run into it a lot. Um, basically, published versions, that's the fancy publisher formatted version, is open to all with internet access because they are digital. You do need to at least have an internet connection to be able to read them, um, regardless of institutional affiliation. They are, instead of being funded by subscriptions, which are usually paid by a library institution, they're funded by article processing charges, which are paid by the author with an asterisk because isn't always that way. Um, then most large commercial publishers have this option. Um, some of them, more than others, um, say Elsevier, Springer Nature do a lot, Taylor and Francis, not so much. Um, they might also offer hybrid journals. Um, and then not as far as like other publishers, the sort of like nonprofit, like university publishers, a lot of them will have this option too. Um, there are also some born open access digital publishers. So these were never making print journals. They're pretty recent. So this would be like Frontiers is a big one that are like a for-profit company. Um, they do have this, like I mentioned before, born digital publishers that don't charge APCs are called Diamond OA. So that's different. Um, the thing about APCs is that they can be very, very steep. There's one um, Springer Nature Journal who was trying to charge $11,000 to publish a single article, which is ridiculous and not even what I pay for my rent in a year. Um, so to think that somebody could pay this uh, for one article is pretty wild. Um, now, there have been some uh, editorial board walkouts over this, which I, I think is fun. Um, and hopefully we see more as there's more um, of this frankly unethical um trying to charge that much money for an article um most of the time it's not going to be that high but they still can be really high and i don't think anyone should have to pay them out of pocket um they can be written into a grant um but again you would have had to have like done this at the beginning but if you have a project coming up and you're thinking okay i'm gonna need to publish this open access you can put a line in your grant about how you're gonna need this much to publish um and since they do vary it'd be helpful to look and see 
like at least get an idea of where you might want to submit the article to. Um, and if you ever need help figuring out like what, what the charge is, I'm always happy to look into that for you. Um, the APCs can also be avoided or reduced by read and publish agreements. Right now we have one that's with Cambridge, um, but some of the other ones are in the works. I will have to get the link and put that in the chat, but if you want to publish in any of those journals, basically, um, we have this agreement through Lyricist, which is a consortium we belong to, that um, our authors, so you just would need to be the submitting author and have your Towson uh, email be the email it's submitted from, um, and they basically send something through and we just approve it and then you don't have to pay. Um, I know not all of their, um, there's a list, so I'll, I'll send out where we can find that and hopefully we'll have some more soon. Um, but as far as making your work visible when maybe you didn't publish um, in an open access journal or maybe you are at the publishing stage and you you didn't have the line in your grant about um, wanting money for an APC and you want to be able to share it, but you do have it published in a um, sort of traditional closed access journal, there are still some other options. Um, a lot of them are going to allow you to publish um, in a repository. So this would be the green OA option I meant before. Um, there are institutional repositories um, like our scholar works, you can submit it there. Um, you could also put in other named repositories. One of the benefits of these is that um, Google Scholar is pretty good at finding them. Um, it isn't always instant, but eventually like it'll be able to find it. And a lot of people do use Google Scholar. So that way, if you're lo they're looking for your article and they don't have access to it through their library, um, if you click like see all versions of this, sometimes it'll just take them to the PDF of this version. Um, now, whether you can post the published version there or not, um, depends, and I also put pay attention to embargoes. Thankfully, we have Sherpa, which is um, this website that I think is very helpful. Um, so they will kind of help you find information about um, different open research options. So um, Sherpa Fact is sort of new. Um, basically, it combines Sherpa Romeo and Sherpa Juliet, which is a they're cutesy names for these, um, to figure out like whether your journal um, that you want to publish in is going to comply with some different um, funder mandates. Now, I know in Europe and in the UK, and this is a UK-based um, website, there are definitely a lot more, they've, they've been doing it longer, so this is kind of more robust for those, but I know NIH is in here, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's in here, so if you're getting money from any of those, that's pretty robust. But what Sherpa Romeo does is it'll tell you what the archiving conditions are for a specific journal, um, and then Sherpa Juliet will help you look up what um, funders conditions are for open access publications. So we'll look at both of them, but we'll do Romeo first. Um, does anyone want to suggest the name of a journal or maybe one they're looking at that I can look up? If not, I'll just pick a random one. Oh, there's chats. I should see if the chat is up. Oh, yes. Green OA is free to publish in. Sorry. Um, ScholarWorks is an option for anything that like you published or you collaborated on. I have fruiting to look at my chat. Okay, I'm just going to look up the Journal of Academic Librarianship because I know it's an Elsevier journal. Um, So it'll tell you the title, it'll give you the ISSN, it'll take you to the URL for the journal, it'll give you what the um what publisher it is, and then it'll talk a bit about the publisher policy. And here there are a lot of icons and it can get a little bit complicated. Um, But it'll talk about what the different um open access pathways are. So this is a journal that is a gold open access journal. Oh, we have education information technologies. I'll look that one up after. Um, actually, I'll look that up right now. So we'll learn about this. Okay, so this has got the ISSN. This is a Springer journal. Um, it'll talk about Plan S and GISC, which of these are like, um, that's like a UK thing. Um, 
So it'll say what you can do with the published version, the accepted version. There's two different things. They might have pathway A or B, and then what you're allowed to do with the submitted version. So the accepted version is going to be like it's gone through review already on the submitted version is the version that you initially submit to the journal. So that's like your... Um, that's like what you wrote and it's probably not formatted. It's probably just a Word document or something like that. So what you're allowed to do with the published version, if you click on this, like the pound sign, because again, it's a British website, is going to have what the open access fee is. This one says there is a fee to publish that's so going to be gold OA. Um, it does allow this. There's no embargo um, that has you publish it under a Creative Commons attribution license. So they'll have information about what you're allowed to do. Um, it'll tell you whether or not they deposit in PubMed Central, and it'll tell you what locations you're able to share it on. Um, so in order to do this, you would have to pay the fee. Um, as far as, oh yes, embargo, I should say what it is. So there's an example here I'll show you. Um, so for accepted version, which is pathway B. So this is saying if you want to publish it in um, an institutional repository or funder designated location, it says there's a 12 month embargo. And um, I know we talked about that a bit with the um, Nelson memo that they're, they want to do away with the embargo. But what that means is that the publisher is saying, I get to share your published version of the article for 12 months, then after 12 months, you're allowed to put it in another repository so other people are being able to read it. So um, the idea there is that they're kind of saying, okay, I'm the exclusive distributor of this for this year after it publishes, probably hoping that more people are going to subscribe to and pay for the journal, knowing that there's not another option to get it, um, or at least to get like the final version of it. Um, and then after that 12 months, you're able to share it in a repository. So in this case, it says a funder designated location or institutional repository, and then they'll have conditions. So let's say you publish in this journal, you you didn't pay this fee, or even if you, yeah, you didn't pay this fee. So you're, they have sort of like a subscription access version to it. You can put your accepted versions. This is not going to be with the publisher formatting, but it would be the reviewed version. Um, so the text would be the same. It just wouldn't have like the fancy Springer PDF format to it. Um, and let's say you want to submit this to ScholarWorks at Towson. So after the 12 months, you're allowed to do that. Um, and this is interesting to me because I have not actually seen a publisher's bespoke license before. So that must mean that they have like a specific licensing condition that you have to um put it under, I'm going to have to look into that. Most of the time it's Creative Commons and there is also a function in um, ScholarWorks and in most repositories, it's going to allow you to select a Creative Commons license. So that's important to note because usually they'll have requirements. Like it has to be Creative Commons by non-commercial, no derivatives or something like that. Um, and in order to comply with that, you'll need to indicate that when you submit it. Um, but the other conditions are going to be like that you have to acknowledge the published source. You need to link to the publisher version with the DOI. So if people come across it, they have the option of going to published version. Um, and that post prints are subject to Springer Nature reuse terms. That's interesting. So if there's something like this, I would I would look into it further. Um, and if you ever are like, I don't really have time for that. I, I have time for that. I'm always happy to look into these kinds of things and like um, licensing restrictions because I find it interesting. Um, so if you ever run into anything like that, please let me know. And then usually um, they're going to just let you put it on your personal website, some version of it, usually again, like a non-formatted one. Once it's published, you're going to need to, again, link to the DOI, um, acknowledge it with a citation. This there's looks like there's kind of a uh, policy, probably a long one somewhere saying that you need to put like a set statement along with it. Um, typically, though, whatever the submitted version is, so whatever version you initially submitted to the journal that hasn't gone through review, it hasn't gone through editing. Usually you can do what you want with that. Um, and the reason you might want to put that is maybe you just did something you're really excited about and you want to share it with um, others in your field. Um, and you want them to be able to see it because you have some novel findings or for some other reason, um, even though it's not going to be published for a few months, maybe. Um, in that case, you might want to put it in a preprint repository and you are um, almost always allowed to do this. Um, so that is another way I wanted to mention, too, 
that kind of went nicely um, so that you can share your work that way. Um, Preprint repositories, um, you'll see them a lot in the sciences. Um, I wanted to point out a few of these. Um, Archive is has been around for a long time. I believe it started out in physics and then expanded to some other STEM fields. So you've got like statistics now, electrical engineering. Um, you can put your preprints in here. I know for this one, you at least need to make an account and like kind of have them verify that you're like a real researcher at an institution. One way you can do this is to like get someone else who has an account to like be like, yeah, this is a real person and they'll let you post your papers on here. Um, again, this is another way to increase visibility, get more people to at least see what you've been working on. Um, you can also come onto this website to see like what others have been doing and what like the super recent research in a field is. Um, of course, it's limited to these fields on here, um, but there are other uh, like subject specific preprint repositories out there. Um, so if you have like a specific need for one, I can help you find one. Um, usually if something is on here is more than a few months old, there probably is a published version out there. So it's like worth trying to find that if you can. I know another one, um, Repack is uh, for economics. So, um, and some fields have like a, a culture kind of of reading others preprints and like annotating the preprints. Um, so this, this is a good way to find um, papers and things like that. Then another place I wanted to point out that you could put things in um, because this is sort of like ScholarWorks in a way. And the one other thing I wanted to say about ScholarWorks is that I'm talking a lot about articles, but it doesn't just have to be articles. Um, it can host a lot of different types of resources. So um, it doesn't have like video streaming or audio streaming capabilities, but if it's hosted somewhere else, we can link like, so we can't embed it in there, but we can like have that kind of file in there. Um, whoever was looking at it would just need to be able to play a video or play audio. Um, on on their computer or wherever they're accessing it from. Um, but another place is Figshare, which I like because you can deposit data sets. Also another thing you can do in ScholarWorks at Towson, but you can share sort of like non-traditional research outputs here as well that aren't necessarily just like an article or a data set. So um, you can make a free account. Um, you have limited storage um, up to 20 gigabytes, but if you have like, if you're in the arts maybe, and you have like photographs, you have something like that as part of your research um, that you wanna share, Figshare does make it easy to do that. Um, so they can host a lot of different types of content. And because it's like an international um, repository, they um, like other, that enhances the discoverability because other people around the world will be able to find it. Um, one thing I know about them is that they have a lot of places will have like a forever archiving policy, like this work is backed up using, I won't get into like the details of it, but a lot of them are um, basically, there's another version of it kept somewhere. So if something like really bad happens to the site, there's like a backup version of it. Um, Figshare has like a policy, not for the life of the site, but for like 10 years specifically. Um, so I guess... I would probably also put it somewhere else if you're allowed to, because uh, who knows where it'll go after 10 years, although I, I tend to trust Figshare. Um, cool, so. So now back to library support for publishing. I know we mentioned a lot of different places and a lot of different tools, um, so, and there are a lot of links. So these guides are gonna be other places and that, that will link to all of these. So I think I'll just show one of the guides. Um, I know I have it open. Okay. So you have a deciding where to publish guide, which is actually a different workshop. So some of this content will be repeated if you want to come to that one that's later on this year or this semester. Um, but this guide, and you would get to it the same way you got to the um research metrics guide. You could just search deciding where to publish. I will I put a link in the chat. Oh, you put it, you beat me to it. Okay. Oh no. Okay. So oh. the um on here we have journal suggesting tools. So we didn't really mention these. I will talk about that a bit in the other, um, the later workshop, but it's gonna talk about different like journals you can explore further. Most of them are gonna have you put in like a title or an abstract and some keywords and it'll suggest some journals for you. 
Um, there's information about author rights. Then we have Sherpa. Oh yeah, I didn't really show Sherpa Juliet. I forgot to. Basically what that does is it um, has you um, look at a different funder. Actually, I should do that now. Let's do the national. Actually, I want to do NASA. That's fun. Okay, so we'll see what NASA's requirements are. Um, so it'll have like their funder information. It talks about that whether or not they require open access archiving, um, what you're supposed to archive, like what version of it. So if they have the publisher's version, usually they're going to want the author's final version. So that's going to be without the formatting. What the permitted embargo is, if there is a permitted embargo, um, whether you can put it in named repositories, that sort of thing. Um, so they don't have, so they basically don't mention that they require you to publish something like Gold OA, but you have to like at least deposit a version of it somewhere. Um, so that can be helpful. And oh, another thing too that I won't get super into, but I will mention is they have Open Door. So what this is, is it's a directory of open access repositories. So you can browse by country, you can do like an advanced search. If you're not looking for um, like a specific repository name, I would probably do the advanced search because um, it's hard to find, but they do have a lot of stuff on here. So we're, you know, looking at like archive, talking about scholar works at Towson, that type of thing is, is what is in here. I don't think it's as robust as Sherpa Romeo or Sherpa Julia, but it is out there and it is an option and you can, you know, browse by subject. So that might be helpful in finding a subject repository to put your work in. Um, then, okay, so another thing too, um, we have subscriptions through the library to journalytics and predatory reports. Um, Carrie, remind me what, is it the medical ones that aren't in here? Yeah, so Cabells does uh, snapshots of journals. You can look at journals to see their turnaround time and publication policies, but they are severely lacking in medicine and health. They have a separate product for that, which costs a lot more money. Um, so you might find something there, but mostly it's limited to other disciplines. Something like economics education. Okay, accounting and business research. So it'll give you the altmetric report on it. Um, it'll tell you what the open access options are. So this one's traditional. This one says green. So if you go into here, it'll say... Um, Oh yeah, what the manuscript guidelines are. Um, it'll give you information about journal metrics, um, how you submit, what the acceptance rate is, whether or not they do invited articles, the um, like style guide, um, and then like what the peer review process is. Um, they also have another product, predatory reports. We have two separate links to it in here, but you can also get to it from this other one. Um, so it's going to say what the violations are. I'm going to look at one with 10 violations. Mm -hmm. So usually these don't have, um, like a cover image because most of the time they don't have one. It'll tell you how long it's been around and then what the violations to kind of the policy are. So these ones fell, uh, victim to a, a sort of a sting paper so that's not good the editor publishes research in his own journal probably also not good mm -hmm. um sometimes the violations on here aren't like as bad it'll just be like oh they don't have clear license reuse terms which still isn't great yeah this one doesn't have a policy for digital preservation so i probably wouldn't submit something to it but to me that is sort of less egregious than um some of these things on here um then that can be helpful when finding a place to share your work. We'll go back to the where to publish guide because I didn't open it in a new tab. Um, these are other journal information. This was linked also on the impact, um, the impact guide. Yeah, it lets um, you compare journals. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's some information here about predatory publishing, things like that. Yeah, we've got links to the lens um, dimensions is another place you can use which we did not talk about. Yeah, another great free tool. Yeah, to look stuff up. So um, I think that is about all I wanted to show. We will end on saying that, uh, oh yeah, there's these other guides. Um, the open access one isn't very robust because I keep putting off. Um, oh, you know what though? 
don't oh, know this heinous picture of me that I put on here. Okay. So if you go to the article processing charges page, it's going to have like what our current, um, I, oh, oops. Okay. What our current, um, like read and publish agreements. We've only got the one with Cambridge University Press, but this will link right to like the eligible open access articles that explain you what they are. Um, this is through the end of 2025. Clear Assist, Cambridge OA Journals. Unfortunately, there's not a way to just link to our list. We basically have to put um, United States in and then it'll give you a drop down list. You can find us on there. There we are. So that'll take us to our publishing agreement. Um, so basically what you've got to do, um, oh, they they do want you to use ORCID. So that's a good point about um, using, uh, making sure you have ORCID. Um, you would choose the gold open access and you'd pick Creative Commons license. There might be specifics about which ones you need. Um, yeah, in this case, check funder mandates. Again, I'm always happy to double check this for you if you want another pair of eyes on it. I will look it over. Um, so you might need to choose the Creative Commons attribution license um, and they have contact information. So you can filter, you can pick by subject. Let's do medicine okay so these are all of the ones that you can publish in um some of them might be hybrid now so no cambridge has some journals that don't offer an open access option at all um but i think it's only like a handful and i don't think they should um show up here so yeah this one contains open access if you wanted to publish in cardiology and the young you could um just make sure you're the submitting author and that you've um used your towson email when doing that Okay, I'm glad I remembered to show that because I said I was going to and then I didn't. Um, so we also do have upcoming workshops. Um, this is relatively early in the semester, so we do have a few coming up. You at least have been at this one um, or are watching the recording for it. But we do have some. So we've got this one is in person because it does involve lunch. But there's also if you just want to watch um, online. There's one about exploring textbook adoption options. That's next week. Um, we have another one that's in person because it's meant to be more of like a face-to-face -face discussion, but I believe there will be coffee. Um, so that is Tuesday the 24th um, from 10 to 11. That's part of, um, if you want to follow up with Cambridge Open Access. Oh, you can contact me. Um, yeah, I'm like the contact person for that. So if there's one you're looking at specifically or you want me to look into it, um, you can also involve um, your subject librarian if you would like, but um, most of my job is, is uh, like this publishing agreement we have. Hopefully it'll be more in the future, but right now it's just that one. Um, we have the understanding the cost of open access publishing that I mentioned. That'll be the 25th. Those are part of open access. We Carrie's doing a PubMed one. I have a Creative Commons one. Um, we've got politics of citations. That our colleague Jasmine does, and I'm ending with, or no, we're both doing deciding where to publish, yeah. so I did oh, mention yes. that. Yes, that's both of us, all the way in December, so keep some of these in mind. If you're not able to make them, most of them are virtual, um, and most of them are recorded, with the exception of um, this attribution collaborative digital projects one. Um, the curse of too many tabs. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Um, do you have any questions now or you have any questions like after? Uh, feel free to reach out. We can also stop recording if you want to ask questions that aren't sure, recorded. We'll stop recording. We can also trim that. Yeah.